the process of bidding on federal contracts, especially on a website like Sam.gov, can be very overwhelming, challenging, and intimidating to say the least. Everybody always says that it's like learning a second language or another language, and it, it really is. The thing is, a lot of us new small businesses that are entering the federal space, whether you're B2B in the commercial sector um, or you're a subcontractor and you want to be a prime, a lot of small businesses, they do a lot of things that set themselves back and behind. And these really are some common pitfalls that I see happening. So today I'm going to be sharing with you three of these common pitfalls in quite a bit of detail, as well as some recommendations on how to avoid them and what to do instead so that you can learn this process of bidding in its entirety a lot faster and a lot more effectively for your business. So you ultimately can start winning more contracts, right? But before we get into that, since I know bidding is such a huge challenge and I've learned more and more about that in recent months, about the exact challenges small businesses are facing. I'm letting you all know, um, I'm gonna give you more information at the end of this video if you are interested, but I am kickstarting a new small business incubator called the First Fed Bid. As you can kind of guess from the name by design, we are gonna be solely focused and double down on small businesses that are transitioning from the commercial space. You've got an existing established business, but you know you're trying to break into this federal contracting game and you need some help and you, you realize that there's an advantage to maybe not spending the next couple of years trying to figure this out on your own. Um, so kind of having a, a support system with training and coaching um, is what I'm gonna be offering in its beta format. So it'll be limited students, um, limited number of participants, but if that's something that you're interested in more, I can talk more about that at the end of the video as well as give you a link if you want to um, fill out a few pieces of information. I do have a calendar now set up for that as well to start talking with people in January to kind of get things going here uh, at the start of 2022. So for today, we're talking about three pitfalls to avoid, again, as an established business entering the federal marketplace. So the first pitfall that I want you guys to stop doing, I want you to avoid, is to avoid trying to read every single word, every single line, every single sentence of these pages. Because as you know, there are dozens and hundreds of pages involved in these solicitations. And not every page is created equal. So we need to keep that in mind. Otherwise, you're going to be spending hours and hours trying to decipher through this. And at the end of it, you may not even have anything to show for it. And first off, you know, I get it. We don't initially start out trying to read things line by line, but because you don't know what you're trying to focus on, and this is where the problem comes in, you end up reading a lot more than you should trying to find the information that you're after. I think that resonates with a lot of us and that makes a lot of sense. It's just kind of part of the process. You may feel like you're never going to understand this stuff and it's just too hard and it's too complicated, but you know, I've been there. I know a lot of clients that have been there. I promise you it's not. One thing you should know right off the bat is this happens to the best of us, even contracting officers or consultants or whoever that have been in this space for 10, 20, 30 years, they end up reading more than they necessarily have to, to find the information that they're looking for. So just know that there's always going to be a bit of an element of that. You're never going to go from, 100 to zero on that, there's always gonna be a little bit. So don't put that pressure on yourself and that expectation up front to have to you know, be a master at this stuff. It's a skill that you're gonna build over time. So one thing that I see actually starts to benefit new contractors right away when they start trying to read through these things and make sense of them is to have a clearly defined goal or agenda for why you're reading through the solicitation in the first place and what are you reading it for? You know, Are you reading this because you're trying to read it in entirety? Or is that what you're doing because you don't really know where else to start? So if you have an agenda up front knowing, hey, I'm trying to go in and find the, the set aside or I want to see if this thing you know, requires past experience or past performance, then you have something very specific that you're looking for and you're not going to kind of fall prey to reading through the whole thing, just expecting to pick up information that you think is important. I need you to understand that this is a skill set that gets developed through practice over time. So to build your skill, you're gonna get started learning the different sections and what they contain. For example, you're gonna have a, a solicitation or a SF-1449 form or a 1442 form, okay? You're gonna to start to see that in repetition, but you're also gonna get very comfortable uh, eventually with looking at statements of work, PWSs, pricing sheets, wage determinations, amendments, and many other documentations and sections of a solicitation. These things are all going to become repetition for you at some point. And it's kind of like when you hear your favorite song on the radio for the first time, 
you know, you immediately stop what you're doing and you start paying attention to that song and you start to react to it and you like it and it's awesome. But then you listen to it again and again and again. And after the 20th time of listening to that favorite song, the next time that song comes on the radio, you realize it's on the radio like halfway through, right? Because you didn't even pay attention once that song came on. It was only after a little while. And that's because your brain starts to normalize it because you've listened to it so many times. And so that same exact thing is going to happen with you. Your brain is going to start to normalize these things as you start to understand this is a skill that you're building over time and you're reading through these things again and again and again. So this solicitation may look like it's 100 pages right now, but as you begin to normalize these things, you're gonna realize it's not 100 pages, it's 10 pages of a PWS, it's 15 pages of this, it's seven pages of that, two pages of that, and those all add up to maybe 100 pages, but the way that you think about it is gonna be quite different because now you understand the different sections, components, attachments, etc. And once that light bulb goes off, you realize not every page is created equal and you don't give every page equal weighting. You understand that there's these sections that are there for you when you're ready to go to them, but not everything you have to read through right off the bat to maybe get some of those quick initial answers that you're after and what you're initially reading for. And I also have a tip for you to make this process even easier. And I've mentioned it a few times in recent videos, but it's using that control F, the control find, whether you're on PC or Mac, um, to also help you to navigate and be a GPS through these documents. Once you start to know a little bit, you know, from our last step, what you're looking for, you don't have to scroll to try to find all these areas. You can be a bit more efficient by using that control find or that control F feature on your computer to look for certain things. For example, evaluation or instruction or, you know, statement of work, PWS, pricing, depending on what you're looking for, just kind of doing a control F search can get you there a lot quicker. Um, or even if you, you know, you found it initially and you're like, oh man, where did I see that? I've got a hundred pages to go through now. You can go back and find something that you once found because maybe you didn't bookmark it or write down the page number. Um, it can be a really quite effective and efficient way of, of going about finding information once you're comfortable knowing what you're looking for. Another thing to keep in mind is you gotta set a time limit on this, especially when you're starting out and you know you don't have all the answers and you know you don't know exactly what you're doing. Put a time limit. Again, choose what you're looking for, why you're looking for that, but then how long are you gonna allow yourself to look for it? You know, really 20 to 30 minutes, you should be taking a break, you should be stepping away, or you should maybe be stepping backwards, realizing like, hey, you know, I need to learn a little bit more to find this thing or to understand this. Um, 20 to 30 minutes is probably a good gauge to get started out. Literally set a timer or watch the clock if you have to and say, okay, I'm committing the next 20 to 30 minutes to find this thing or to understand this thing. When you do this, you start to set yourself up for success and you, you allow yourself to avoid the frustration and some of those negative psychological things that start to take after when you start going cross-eyed reading through these solicitations for hours at a time. Um, instead, you start to make the game more winnable for yourself and say, okay, you know, I found it in 10 minutes, I found it in 20 minutes, and this becomes a practice you can begin to implement in your bidding process and it also becomes something that you can start to improve on over time and continue to build that skill level. So make the game winnable by setting time constraints up front so that you know you're not gonna have to be staring at this thing for an hour because you've only got 20, 30 minutes that you're allotting yourself to, to work on it. So the last thing I wanna say about this first pitfall is I highly encourage you guys to implement some sort of bid, no bid system. And I've done some recent videos on those. I, I recommend you go and check those out because um, this is gonna be a process that you have to be a cookie cutter solution to show that how you're gonna approach and how you're gonna invest your time in every single solicitation. If you don't have a process set up, it's gonna be different every single time, and it's gonna be hard to get better at something if you're doing it different each time. So since we all agree that time is money, I ask you, are you treating this time that you're spending reading through solicitations and trying to make sense of this stuff like a business decision, or are you being wasteful with your time? So now if the first pitfall was reading through solicitations word for word and realizing there's gotta be a better way, the second pitfall is going to be avoiding making last minute bid, no bid decisions. And these kind of go hand in hand uh, because you didn't have a process before and now you know you gotta start moving towards one. So you don't wanna be making last minute decisions. So you find a bid on sam.gov, right? And it's due in a day or two. I think a lot of us 
who have been active on Sam, we can kind of say, hey, this seems like it's in a real house. You know, it's due tomorrow though. You know, what are we gonna do? So you think it's a good one to go after. You don't wanna miss out on it. So you decide to, you know, slap together some pricing. Maybe you come up with some resumes or whatever technical information you need and maybe you win. But if you don't, it's also okay because you didn't invest that much time in it anyways, right? So guys, can you win doing this? Yes, you, you can. There's potential for it. I'll give you that. Do I recommend that you avoid doing that? That's also a yes, and I'll tell you why. So with everything that you do with your government contracting business, there is an opportunity cost sacrifice. I think we're all probably familiar with what the opportunity cost is. It means, hey, the cost of choosing to do this or to choose to focus on this versus choosing to focus on this other thing. And that is very much something that comes into play when you are making a last minute bid, no bid decision, and you're deciding to go after it. And again, as a side note, I'm not telling you to never do this, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but I'm just saying it's probably not a best practice. So this opportunity cost sacrifice basically looks like anything that you were focused on that you chose before, and maybe your system produced before, and so it was a good one, now that's going to potentially suffer because you're taking your eye off the ball. You're taking your focus power away from the good thing that you've produced and you're giving all those resources and attention and focus to a last minute thing. And you have to ask yourself at the end of the day, is that really worth it? Because if you don't win this bid or you know, if this is a bid that you end up not even wanting to win, you find out later and we'll talk about that too in a minute. And then you missed out on maybe doing a really good job on this good opportunity that you had lined up for the last couple of weeks. Was that opportunity cost worth it? At that point, there is a sacrifice that's being made that is maybe not in the best advantage for your business. Another thing that happens when you make a last minute bid, no bid decision is you totally abandon your systems. So if you allow yourself to do this once, you're probably gonna allow yourself to do it once again in the future. And like I said, I'm not saying to never do this and to never make exceptions, but your business is only as strong as the processes and systems that you have in place. So the way that you build your skill level is through practicing the same thing time after time, right? But if you start going outside of that and you start practicing several different things time after time, maybe even practicing the wrong things time after time, right? You're going to lose any positive momentum that you have going within your business because you're abandoning those systems that you put there in place for a reason. And now you're just kind of short circuiting them and, and just doing a last minute thing. So basically what I'm saying is if you're gonna do a last minute bid, no bid, make sure that it's not something that you do regularly. And quite frankly, if you're new to bidding, you're you know a business, service-based business, B2B, subcontract or whatever, you're coming to the federal space, I just recommend you kind of don't do it at all so that you set best practices in the ground right from the get-go. So another way to look at this besides your systems and your processes are, are you going to improve your overall bidding strategy by doing this? Are you gonna improve? Are you going to benefit? Are you going to grow? My guess is that it's probably unlikely that you're gonna grow and get a whole lot better from doing a last minute bid, no bid. I'll even go as far to say that you're probably not even doing a proposal debrief if you lose because your whole attitude towards this is, well, hey, I didn't invest that much time and resources into it in the first place. So if I lose, then you know I didn't invest a whole lot. But look at what you're missing. The, the whole goal here, you know, it, it's not just winning. Winning isn't the only reason that we bid. We know that we're gonna lose, right? We know we're gonna lose more than we actually win. So we also bid to practice and get better and get those repetitions in, you know, get under get under the weights and get the reps in, time under tension. We know we're not always gonna win, but we wanna keep improving so that we eventually can improve our win ratios and start to win more and get better at winning and just get more effective at the process in general. So are you really getting better? I don't think so. I think it's a much less likely that you're gonna perform proposal debriefs, like I said, because you didn't really invest much into it. So you're not gonna invest in the ways that you should invest on the backside of things. So it's just you know another way to consider when you're weighing the pros and cons of making a last minute bid, no bid decision. So the last thing that I'll say about this pitfall is some could argue that it actually is reckless. So you know maybe you've just simply missed something when you were bidding it because you were doing like a rush job on it. And then if you win, you may have find out something that you didn't know. You may find out that the, the job was a bit different than what you planned on. Or you may find out that, hey, you didn't price this thing properly. The price should have been higher. And now maybe you won this as a LPTA bid. 
and now you're stuck with the job or you have to kind of default and, and, and go back and not accept the award, which is not the type of reputation we want to have for our small businesses in the government contracting federal arena, right? So maybe there was a, a site visit or maybe because the, the Q&A deadline had already passed, you didn't get to submit your questions because this thing was due in a day. These are some of the things that you know can hurt you, can give you limited information and put you at a risk of being reckless by sending in a bid because you may not have all the information that you need and then it ends up you know, potentially coming to bite you. And if not that worst case scenario, all the other points that we just discussed about this pitfall are still at play. So all in all on this one, guys, can you potentially win? Yes, but I don't think it's a good business practice, especially for small businesses who are trying to build momentum and improve your skill levels at the federal bidding process. So now the last and final pitfall that I know definitely was something that affected me, but I know can affect all of you as well is avoid putting too much pressure on yourself and expecting yourself to understand all of this overnight. It's just not possible. It takes years and this is a lot harder to learn than a lot of other things. And the first reason for that is the learning curve. Okay. You heard me say it every solicitation, every RFP, every RFQ is different. So this can definitely extend that learning curve when you compare it to other things where it's like you're doing the same thing over and over and over and you're getting better at it. Well, you're still doing the same thing, but since there's more moving components, like the solicitations are different, the sections are different and they change, it can be a very slippery slope and a lot harder to gain traction and momentum. It's not your fault, guys. This stuff is hard. So as I said, there are a lot of the same sections and documents, but even how contracting presents those sections and documents can appear different in those documents. Sometimes you see different forms to accomplish the same things, or even sometimes one agency or one contracting office, I've actually seen this, will just make up a form that you've never seen before. And you're like, well, what is this? Well, if you want to bid on it, you have to respond to it. These are the sorts of things that when you're trying to learn, they can really be curveballs and kind of throw you off your game here. So since things are always changing, this definitely adds time and experience required to start to piece together this puzzle and really fully understand this bidding process, especially if you're going after multiple agencies at a time. So, you know, I wish that they made it easier for contractors and small businesses, but knowing this and knowing that this is what you're up against from the get go, again, you can take some of that stress and pressure off you and just tell yourself, you know what, this is tough and it's going to take some time and it's not my fault. I'm doing my best and I'm going to learn this and I'm going to get through it. And I know it's easy to get frustrated. I know it's you know, possible for doing this a couple months and you just kind of throw in the towel and you give up. And I want to plead with you and I want to avoid you from doing that. And I want to suggest that the reason you're doing that is probably because you don't have any sort of positive feedback loops built in um, through your learning process. It's just like you're expecting to get it and you're not. Therefore, you know, you're not good. Okay. Do that for a certain period of time and your confidence and your morale is going to be beaten down so much that nobody would want to do this in that type of situation. So again, building off of an earlier point, you know, I have some recommendations for you to make this game more winnable so that you can have those, those kind of baby steps. So you want to set up expectations and milestones from the get go in your mind as you're going through this stuff. So whether it's trying to extract, you know, like key information, or you're trying to find what's required in your proposal response. You know, that's a big thing to figure out. Um, maybe even it's just trying to find a bid up front that is even a match for your company that's in your wheelhouse. We are all way too hard on ourselves. And all these little things that I just mentioned should be acknowledged as markers on your path and journey. Once you've kind of been able to check the box and find those, that's a big deal. You know, we need to acknowledge that and celebrate it. If you do that, you're going to start giving yourself a little bit more positive feedback that will in turn give you the juice to keep going. And just for an example, you know, we wouldn't put this unfair expectation on our children that are trying to learn something that's new for them, but that is now easy for us. So why would we put ourselves in that unfair situation? We can all probably agree that if we did that to the child too, the child would become frustrated, overwhelmed, and maybe even demoralized at learning the topic altogether. So we're not currently breaking this down into baby steps. We're trying to eat the elephant all at once and nobody expects you to be able to do this. So if this at all sounds like you consider, you know, not being so hard and pressured on yourself and instead consider some of these things that I'm recommending in the video. And Hey, if this doesn't sound like you, you've got this part on lockdown. Congratulations. You're probably in the top 
5% because a lot of new small business contractors, they really get bogged down with this stuff. But now at least we can understand why we're feeling frustrated, overwhelmed, and intimidated, okay? It's normal. And so the last thing that I wanna say about this for our three pitfalls for today's video is, you know, if you're in the space, if you've been following me for a little while, um, this is just something that I think is interesting, so I thought I would share it with you. How many people, whether it's on, on YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, you know, just websites in general, do you see teaching the bidding and the proposal writing process? Where can you go to get that information? You know, maybe similar to like the, the bid reviews and some of the proposal examples that I've given on my channel. How many people are trying to teach this bidding and proposal writing process, okay? Not a lot. If you don't know the answer, I'll tell you it's almost a zero. And the reason for that is it's really tough. Instead, you know, it's a lot easier to try to teach people how to get registered in SAM or how to market or do their CAPE statement. And there's a lot of free resources for you to go out there and do that where you don't have to, you know, make a significant investment just to kind of even figure out if this is something that you want to do. I'm here and I've been here for quite a while trying to teach you this process. And, you know, I'm, I've been a coach for three years. You know, I've been in this space for almost a decade, eight, nine years now, but I've only been a coach for three years in this capacity. So I'm still learning. But uh, more and more, especially this last year, I've learned a lot more about the challenges as it comes to bidding. And again, what I was touching on at the beginning of this video, that's why I'm coming out with the first Fed Bid Incubator Program for small businesses that are established that are trying to enter the federal space. And they realize, you know what, I've got the registration thing. You know, I've got, you know, set asides or whatever and, and all these different things. But, the, you know, I'm hitting a wall when it comes to actually bidding and I know that if I'm not bidding, I'm not winning because there's nothing more important that I could be doing besides actually responding to RFPs and RFQs for my business. So I would like to invite you, if you are at all interested in becoming a beta participant, there is now a link in the description of the video where I ask you a few questions to learn a little bit more about your business to see if you would be a good fit to be a beta participant. And if so, it'll take you to my calendar and you can book some time in January for us to talk for 20, 30 minutes to see if this thing's a match. And then uh, February, we're looking to actually kick off the beta version of the program, First Fed Bid. And we'll be kind of going through that week by week live through live lectures and curriculum. And that will be followed up with also uh, weekly coaching calls as well. So all the information is in the link if you're interested in becoming a beta participant. After the beta is concluded, we will be taking the whole program to market. The price will be increasing. So that's kind of my way to say thank you for participating in the beta. Um, there is a bit of a price reduction up, up front. But again, the link for that is in the description. If you know that 2022 is the year for your business where you need to take bidding and proposal writing seriously, you realize this is what's holding you back. Um, that's singularly focused what we're focusing on. That's why I named the program First Fed Bid, and that's why I'm calling it an incubator program so we can help you know establish small businesses get their first few, not just your first one, but your first five, 10 bids out so that you can really feel confident about this process. So let me know in the comments if you liked this video. It's kind of a new setup for me, um, but I really enjoyed talking to you about bidding in this aspect and in this way. And also, again, um, if you're interested in speaking with me about being a participant in the beta program, I look forward to seeing you on my calendar. So guys, hit that like button and I'll see you in the next video.